Hey everyone, it's Lindsay. Uh, welcome to week five of the semester. The topics of the week are sexual orientation and talking really about the sexual orientation spectrum. Um, everybody has a sexual orientation. That seems kind of like duh, but oftentimes when we start talking about sexual orientation, people only think about the non-heterosexual, the non-sort of majority. Um, so it's really important that we just remember everybody has a sexual orientation. Some of us know what ours is. Some of us are still figuring it out. Um, when we talk about uh, sexual orientation we often you know define it in terms of sort of, of straight and gay heterosexual and homosexual and we'll talk about what those sort of uh, names mean sometimes we talk about bisexuality less so we talk about pansexuality queer identities um, and asexual and aromantic folks um, last week in the past two weeks we've been talking about how gender is a spectrum right we know that there's boy and girl but also there's a lot of people who don't fit neatly into boy and girl and so if that's true we should also recognize that in terms of, of the sexuality spectrum people are not just gay or straight there's a lot of different ways uh, to express somebody's sexuality so from a historical perspective, the words heterosexual and homosexual were first created um, by doctors in the, the late 1800s. These were used as diagnostic measures. So people were, were diagnosed with sort of the disease of homosexuality. Um, and there's some videos this week that you can listen to that will talk sort of about the, that sort of, of stuff. That's not to say sexual identity was erased uh, previous to then. Um, in fact, lots of, of historical documents show us that there was probably some pretty famous um, same-sex attracted or other sort of, of identities prior to that. Um, we know Alexander the Great had a lot of, of male lovers. We know that um, some of the other uh, people in sort of, of history had some uh, same-sex sort of, of lovers and notes and all these sort of things. And you can look up queer history uh, in a lot of, of different places. However, it's hard to assign an, a sexual identity label to those people because in that time, we didn't identify people by their sexual orientation. People were just people, right? That's actually a really um, new sort of, of reckon recognizing sort of, of way to categorize people. Um, so the way in which the sexual orientation sort of spectrum first really grabbed hold in contemporary sort of society was in the late uh, 1940s and 50s. There was a sex researcher named uh, Dr. Dalford Kinsey. He is a entomologist professor um, from my alma mater, Indiana University, and he was kind of a kinky guy and he wanted to be able to study sexuality in humans. Um, he originally studied gall wasps, which is weird, right? Um, but because he was a kinky guy, he was like, hey, I have all these ideas about human sexuality. And so um, at the time, the president of the university was Herman B. Wells, and Herman B. Wells was a staunch supporter of academic freedom. He decided that, yes, actually, if this is something that is passionate for Dr. Kinsey, he should be allowed to do it, even though back in the 40s, 50s, people were like, oh, sex, we don't talk about that. Dr. Kinsey was like, yeah, well, we should talk about that. And so Dr. Kinsey got into a car with a whole bunch of research assistants, um, a whole bunch of cars and a whole bunch of stuff and drove all across the country and interviewed tens of thousands of people about their sex lives. Um, and so Dr. Kinsey developed the Kinsey scale, which was the first sort of um, way that we were able to identify sexual orientation spectrum as not just gay and straight, um, that it was actually a gradation. And so he said on the scale that the, the Kinsey scale went from zero to six and zero being exclusively heterosexual behaviors and six being exclusively homosexual behaviors. And what he actually said is that Actually, it's really rare to find somebody who was a pure zero or a pure six. He said most people fall between that one and five. And so these things and these ideas that like homosexuality and, and same sex attraction are abnormal is actually wrong because a lot of people are participating in them or doing things or have underlying sort of, of feelings. Now, the, the Kinsey scale wasn't um, completely without sort of, of critique. Um, if you look at the Kinsey scale, there are some um, weird sort of things about it. Number one, it's a binary scale, right? So it only talks about men and women, so heterosexual and homosexual. Well, now we know that gender is much more expansive than that. And so for people who are gender expansive, they don't really fit into the Kinsey scale super well, right? There's also some weird ways in which the, um, 
categories Dr. Kinsey came up with are, are hard to explain, right? So one means incidental homosexual behavior. What is incidental? Like, did you have a dream one time about somebody? Did you kiss one person? What does incidental mean? And so while it's not a perfect scale and it's something that we don't currently use today, it was an important sort of scale because it was the first sort of conceptualization that there are, are things beyond just gay and straight and that gayness is, is not sort of a mental illness. It's not an aberrant sort of, of behavior. It's actually pretty widely uh, practiced by a lot of people in some degree or another. Okay, so one of the questions that I often get in, in classes or in, in workshops is, are you born gay? Do you become gay? You know, is it a biology thing? Do you have a gay gene or do you choose to be gay? Some combination of both. Well, there are some interesting sort of, of perspectives on that and there is some sort of research, but really when I think about it, I always think about what are the implications either way, right? If we're born this way, then that means, you know, we, we could test for a gay gene. What do we do when we know that we found a gene? Well, sometimes we do gene therapy. And so maybe there would be people who'd be like, oh, we can find the gay gene. Well, then we can also fix that gay gene because there's something inherently wrong with gay people. Um, and so I always say, hey, ooh, do we really need to do those sort of things? On the other hand, if it's cho choice, oh, well, you're choosing to be gay. Well, then if somebody who's straight, why not they choose to be gay? Uh, and if they did choose it, who really cares? They, it's somebody's own sort of, of perspective. So my bigger picture perspective oftentimes is, does it matter? Does it really matter how somebody arrived at the identity that they did? Or perhaps should we just treat people the way they should be treated, right? So that is some place that I come from when we talk about sexual orientation and, and sort of gender identity and the spectrum is there's no way for me to know better than you as a lived experience know your story. And so why would I argue with somebody about whether they chose something, whether it was inborn traits, if it was a mix of both, why don't we just say, hey, you know what? People are experts within their own lives. And if they are an expert in their own lives, I'm just going to choose to believe whatever it is that they tell me. Okay. So when we talk about sort of uh, the community, um, we have what I call alphabet soup. So alphabet soup is, you know, those, all those letters that you're not really sure what they mean, um, or you kind of know what they mean, but they're kind of confusing. So the one that you see the most is LGBTQ or some sort of combination of that. And that stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. And we'll talk about sort of those identities. There are a lot of different ways to describe it. Um, the local Stonewall Alliance Center of Chico, you Used to be the LGBTQIA2S plus uh, community center, which is a mouthful, and so um, it has been shortened from there from LGBTQ plus. Right, the more identities that we have, the more letters that we can add, the more sort of confused that we get. Um, so when we talk about what is a name for the entirety of the community, we don't really have a, a good one. But LGBTQ is the one that I most often use, or LGBTQ plus, because that covers sort of anybody who is in this gender and sexual minority sort of community, um, anybody who very sort of from the norm of heterosexual and cisgender, okay? So when we talk about um, gay people, so the term homosexuality, uh, homosexuality was first originally used as a diagnostic tool to, to diagnose somebody uh, with the disease of being gay. Um, we don't use that term anymore. GLAD now defines it as an offensive sort of, of term. Anybody who uses the word homosexual generally isn't somebody who is accepting or an ally of, of the community. Usually you hear it with like really super conservative politicians who are talking about the homosexual and their lives and blah, 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 blah. And so, yeah, if you're going to be somebody who's hip and modern and an ally, uh, you're going to want to use a word that's different than that. And so oftentimes we use the word gay. Um, gay is, is a sort of catch-all term for people who are same-sex attracted, um, but most particularly gay is attributed to sort of the male side of the, the spectrum, right? Women tend to use the word lesbian to describe their same-sex attractions. One thing that's really important is within the LGBTQ community, oftentimes people will refer to it as the gay community, right? What did I just say? Gay really stands for sort of male um, sexuality. And so for a lot of people, they don't want to be part of the gay community because that puts male sort of sexuality at the front of this sort of, of spectrum of people. And so that's where LGBTQ uh, 
communities have have been able to come around. Now I have some videos this week to have um, actual voices of, of people talking about their experiences. So there's a video from some gay men talking about their coming out experience. There's some videos about some lesbian women talking sort of about how they realized that they were lesbians and their first experience with a woman. Um, and then there is a video uh, talking about sort of the difference between bisexuality and pansexuality. Bisexuality and pansexuality um, are very overlapping in a lot of ways. They're unique different but there's a lot of similarity and so hopefully the video there will help you to um, understand that. Finally um, the Q in LGBTQ is queer. Queer is an umbrella term. I myself identify as queer. Um, queer is a, a word that invites a conversation though you're not required to have it. Queer says I'm not part of sort of dominant society. I'm not heterosexual. I'm not cisgender. I'm somehow different right but how I'm different is something that you would have to discover if you got to know me, right? And so for a lot of people, people choose to use queer because it, it doesn't lock you into any sort of box. It doesn't say I'm this or I'm that. It says I'm just not part of a sort of mainstream society. And so people get to self-define sort of what queer means to them. It uh, has very heavy political connotations. It's not a word that's accepted by all communities and in, in all sort of, of places. It tends to be sort of a radical political word. Um, and so not everybody's comfortable using it, but it is quickly becoming much more popular sort of across the country. It started sort of on college campuses on the West Coast, and it's now spread to a lot of places. Uh, when I was growing up in Indiana, nobody identified as queer because it was often used sort of as a slur, um, but now it's a pretty popular and, and well accepted sort of, of term. Finally, one sexuality that is much different from, from the rest of these is asexuality. And there's a video that talks about asexuality uh, and aromanticism. Asexuality is the lack or the lack of desire to want to have sex with people. Aromantic is much more about partnerships and being able to have these sort of things. So you can be asexual and aromantic. You can be asexual and romantic, or you could be romantic, um, or you could be aromantic and not asexual. There's a lot of different sort of, of combinations. Hopefully the video will be able to help you sort of uh, work through that. There's also lots of new and um, emerging identity labels, right? One of the best things about contemporary society, society is we can make up uh, new terms if we feel like it, right? So people are always like, oh, it's just so confusing. How do I know? Well, like, but why? Um, if somebody says, hey, that none of those terms really fit for me and I have this new term, okay, then just learn the term. It's not that big of a deal. Um, and so that's where we have these new and expanding sort of, of labels. If somebody uses a label you don't know, it's totally fine to be like, yeah, I've never heard that before. What does that mean for you, right? Provided you're asking in a curious sort of way, in a kind sort of way, and it's somebody that you have a good relationship with, then they're probably gonna tell you what that, that label means to them um, because it's not usually something that they're, they're embarrassed of, they just haven't felt the need to talk to you about it, okay? So now that we've talked about labels, one thing we need to recognize is that behavior does not equal identity, right? And so for a lot of times, particularly in the college sort of uh, realm, I'll get people who will be like, oh, I kissed a girl this past weekend, does that make me a lesbian? And I'm like, I don't know, are you a lesbian? Um, you are the only person who gets to decide what label you use. For a lot of people, uh, the search th for their sexuality kind of goes through highs and lows and ups and downs, and you're trying to figure out these sort of, of things. And so people might make assumptions about your identity based on things that they witness or see. Um, and that's totally natural, right? That's how we make sense of the world. We assign labels to things so that we know what they are. Um, but really the only person who gets to assign the label that you wear is yourself. And so you get to, to, to do those sort of things. And sometimes it's really easy and people just know. Sometimes people are like, yeah, I don't really know. And I'm gonna try on different labels and I'm gonna go through different sort of, of things. And that is the, the important sort of thing. Your label and your sort of sexual identity is who you are, not what you do, okay? Um, so how are transgender and intersex identities different than sexual orientation? Well, they are simultaneously side by side. Everybody has a gender identity. Everybody has a sexual orientation, right? Gender identity is how you see yourself. When you close your eyes and you're like, who am I? That is your gender identity. Sexual attraction or sexual orientation is who you feel attracted to. That could be boys, it could be girls, it could be non-binary people, it could be nobody if you're asexual. And so oftentimes what we like to say is gender identity is who you go to bed as and sexual orientation is who you go to bed with right? Or who you would like to anyway. Uh, and if you're asexual, you're like, yeah, get out of my bed. That's weird. Um, or if you're somebody who is polysexual, you might be like, everybody can be in my bed. 
provided it's consensual and all those sort of, of things, right? These two things are conceptually independent. Everybody has gender identity and everybody has a sexual orientation. However, that sexual orientation spectrum, remember how I talked about at the beginning of this video, how it's very binary sort of a thing from boy to girl? Well, the sexual orientation spectrum was built on this binary system. And now that we know that, that gender is not binary, it kind of makes it hard to fit everybody's sexual orientation into this binary sort of way. So sometimes for some people, the experience of one will influence the experience of another, right? So when we think about those sort of things, this is where people often get confused with, with trans identities and intersex identities and sexual orientation, right? Because they do have a lot of overlap. They do influence each other, even though they're absolutely independent sort of, of concepts, okay? Finally, I want to talk about coming out and being an ally. So coming out is a shortened phrase for coming out of the closet. Um, the closet being the place where we keep all of our sort of dirty secrets, right? Uh, if people are coming over to your house to visit you and your house is a mess, you push everything into the closet to make it look like you don't live like a dirty pig all the time, right? And so that's where that closet sort of, of lingo came from. And then it's been shortened to just coming out. Coming out is your decision to say, this is who I am and I'm going to express who I am. Now we often talk about coming out as like a one-time thing. I always call it the big C and the big O. Um, but coming out in reality happens every day. Anytime that you disclose your identity is um, a, oh, sorry, I have a weird, something came up on my phone. Um, anytime you choose to, to disclose your identity, you've come out to somebody. And so it can be a really laborious sort of thing, especially for people who are newly out, having to, to talk about their identity and say who they are. Um, when people come out, sometimes it's a good experience. My experience was like, yo, family, I have a girlfriend. And they were like, yo, bring her over for dinner. The end. That was my whole coming out experience. For some people, it's not. Um, for some people, it's really awful and, and their families kick them out or do other sort of, of things. And so if someone's coming out to you, just be really um, tender and, and know that if somebody is coming out to you, the reason that they're coming out to you is because they see something in you that means you're a safe person, right? We don't come out to people who we think are going to punch us in the face or are going to say something awful to us. We come out to people that we think are going to accept us. And so if somebody is coming out to you, that means they saw something in you that said, hey, you're a trustworthy sort of person and I want to share this piece of information with you. Um, and so you should thank them. You should say you, you should be honored um, and then realize that it may be a very big deal to them. It may not. It may be just like, a, oh yeah, everybody knows it's not a big deal, but you could be the first person that somebody came out to or, or one of the very first sort of, of people. And so it is a really important um, thing for, for you to be knowledgeable about. Why do people come out? Well, we have lots of reasons. The ability to live openly and honestly. It's stressful to hide an identity, connect with other people in the spectrum, dispel myths and stereotypes, be a role model for others. That's why I'm so loud and out and queer on campus is because I want other people to see that you can be uh, somebody who's queer and out there and be successful and generally well-liked. Um, and that is a, a a reason that I am so loud and out and proud about my queerness on campus and why some other faculty are as well. Risks to coming out, of course, not everybody's nice and not everybody's accepting. Um, some people get thrown out of their homes. Sometimes they lose financial support from their parents. And so there's a lot of reasons that people may not come out. If somebody's not ready to come out, it's never a good idea to push them. Um, it's always a good idea to just say, hey, whenever you're ready, I'm here to stand with you. What does it mean to be an ally? An ally is somebody who stands up with the community and says, hey, I won't let someone treat you poorly just because of your identity. You work to end oppression and, and speak up for things that are, are not okay. Um, allyship is a verb. It's something that you do every day, not a noun. You don't just get to be an ally one time and say you're done. It's something you've got to work out and say, how am I going to be trusted by the community? How am I going to help? How am I going to be engaged in the community to be sort of a, a helpful person? Okay. Um, I have a list of university resources. So our university has a lot of accepting places for LGBTQ folks. And so um, those are listed also in the slides. And this brings up sort of the totality of our gender unicorn. We've talked about gender identity, gender expression, our sex assigned at birth, and now our physical and emotional attractions, okay? Hopefully you have learned a lot. Uh, there is a class activity due by Friday. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Bye.